it took years and years for you to finally achieve your first solo album, Black Labyrinth. Yeah. Was, was this personal chapter a necessary step before even thinking working on a new Korn album? No. I just wanted to put it out because I've been sitting on a fucking shelf for 10 years. <laughs> um, I've done a lot of other projects in that time, but that was the first one I really did and I was most proud of. And it sat there forever and I just wanted to get it out. And so finally it got with the management, new management company and they helped me get it out and I'm just really happy that I, that I got to do that and get that done. Okay. The Serenity of Suffering, your previous album, was a very intense, of course, and particularly heavy album. Was there any thinking of going even heavier for this one? How do you proceed in terms of songwriting after 12 albums? Does it come naturally and organically, or do you try to find the right balance between that heaviness, the catchy choruses, and that obvious need for experimentation? Um. It's funny how we work in corn. The, the band writes, um, and then it just happens organically. You never like put a lot of thought. This one's going to be heavier. This one's going to do this more than that. It's like everybody does their part, and when it's done, it's a corn record. It's not nothing that's really preconceived, or you don't put that much thought into it. Um, when it starts getting like that, like this last record, on the new record, there was a lot of people thinking and having ideas and thought. At least when I started working on the, the working on the uh, the vocals for it, so I basically kicked everyone out and said, "Leave me the fuck alone." And I went in my studio by myself with an engineer, and I did everything by myself because I needed that because it started to get that. I hate that. I think art can really get diluted and fucked up when you start thinking. And I wanted to be more organic and right off the top of my head. And that's what I did personally um, for the record. The rest of the guys they went into a. a studio with Nick in Nashville and recorded all the music and I did a couple sessions with him writing music and we all put it all together and that's how it came together. You worked again with Ralph Robinson and caught the old vibes together for the Remember Who We Are album which mm -hmm. was like a statement for a return to the classic corn sound back then. Um, you've worked with a lot of different major excellent producers, including yourselves, for a few corn albums. But now for the second time, you've chosen Nick uh, to produce the album. As for Alice in Chains, he seems to be the perfect guy to capture corn's truest energy and essence, doesn't he? He's good with the band. Let me say that. I'm, um, he's really inspiring for them to write. The guys get along great with him. I think that's why they, they chose him twice. Um, for me, I just really like, I'm at a point where I could, I produce myself. I'm not, uh, he come in and try to work, but things just, did, sometimes things don't, don't gel up. And it's just better for me to do what I do now, you know. But I think him as a producer overall for the whole project, he was, he was excellent. He really um, harnessed something that the guys wanted to do and put it all together and made everything work good. Most of the songs on the new album are like a link to the old school corn vibes and an even more modern approach appealing to younger audience audiences. The single You'll Never Find Me uh, clearly follows this path and is obviously the right choice to seduce the corn fan base, isn't it? I, get, I mean, I don't know. I honestly don't know. We do the record and usually a manager picks out or the label pick out the song they like best and that ended up being the song. But I sit there and ask me, I don't ever like write for the, that to be the single or this. It's nothing that, it's just, I guess they chose that. And it, I mean, it, it does have a f something for everybody. There's a lot going on in that song. So I think it's a good choice for a first single. I guess so. C can you imagine Korn exploring totally new horizons again, as you did with See You on the Other Side, Untitled and even with The Path of Totality? That was clearly a very, very ambitious and risky move for you back then. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to do it again, um, for sure. I mean, I like pushing the envelope. I like to try and do something completely different. I'm really more of the, I, I'm the vocal one in the band that likes to push boundaries and like and do that. Um, but there's like, the, in the band, it, it just equalizes itself. There's still got to stay us, but do something new. So we'll see, just got done with this one um, and We'll go out and tour that and then who knows. How do you clearly c 
compromise within the five of you as clearly it's you're the one who likes to do with electronics and yeah. DJing and all well, those there's kind tons of, of trucks there's tons of electronics in this record it's just very subtle um we just make everyone happy it is it isn't i'm given the luxury of being able to take the time and do whatever i want on vocals and stuff like that everybody should have that you know we're just it basically comes down that we all get along really good and um if we want to go a certain direction um we go in that direction we all respect each other so it works out fine 25 years ago on your first album uh, the, the the corn album ended with daddy mm -hmm. that incredible intense outlet mm -hmm. now the nothing begins with that backpipe again mm -hmm. Uh, in a very mournful mood. That's a very dark way to introduce the album. It's a dark ass album, man. That's, I think this record that we did is the darkest one we've ever done, pretty much, since the first one. Um, I'm dealing with it really bad. You know, last year was horrible for me, so um, it's just how I healed. It's just it's an album of me going through grief and uh, dealing with that, I guess. You know, I put it into this thing I called the nothing. It was a very dark force, a dark entity that surrounded me. And um, it wasn't completely evil, but it wasn't completely good. That's why I called it that. And that's this, the, the whole concept of the whole record. Every song's about the same thing, about this dark thing trying to overtake me. And, you know, if you ever lose someone really close to you, love one, I mean, you, there's, you don't heal from that. You just learn to adapt. And uh, this is me dealing with it. So that first time, I didn't expect that to happen. They were like, I expected daddy to happen. It just kind of fucking happened. And it was being recorded while it happened. So that's my thing, I guess. For years, um, corn music and attitude was like a catharsis for you since the very beginning um, of, of, the, of, the, of the band. Uh, and for your teenagers, fans as well, who recognize themselves in all your torments. Mm -hmm. um, as a middle-aged, man now um have you healed most of your first previous neuroses through your art and music i mean yeah the stuff from the beginning but does it really ever stop you know that was when i was like dealing with stuff i went through high school and, and early on in life but as i've gotten older now it just that shit never stops there's always problems and i i'm always going to write about that shit you're always dealt what you're dealt the you know the hand you give and you got to just adapt and, and deal with it so I'm always gonna be dealing and trying to heal myself through my music you, you've really created a, a whole mental and graphic universe that have linked different generations of teenagers together mm -hmm. um, and what is what is the most impressive is that us the generation of the 90s is still connected to that world yes like I said because bullshit never stops Life's gonna always throw you curveballs. Life's gonna always, bad things are gonna happen in your life. Do you really ever stop being bullied as a teenager when you're going through that shit and you're a teenager? You get bullied when you're an adult. You can people push you around, people fucking take advantage of you. Um, all those things just seem more amplified when you got testosterone or whatever you go through when you're a kid. All the hormones and all the shit when you're going through puberty as a teenager. Um, once that settles down, it just seems more intense at that time, but you're still going through the same shit. Life is just tough, period. And it's just how you, what you make of it. And as I gotten older, I've learned to deal with it and I've learned to face problems head on, but they still affect me the same way. And that's how it comes across when I sing. When you, when you were a teenager, as you said, you were bullied by yeah, yeah, people. But now you've gained some some kind of self respect. You're a very respectful man. So yeah. that kind of thing is, I guess, part of the past. It's I part of the past. But you I mean you still get bullied through through life. Things still happen. Um, I'm through lots of crazy stuff in my life, and uh, yeah, it's no different than that. The nothing splendid artwork depicts a human silhouette hung by or made of those multiple wires. Mm -hmm. Each of them could represent a part of that whole invisible force that you yeah. sum up as being the nothing. Can you explain that concept to us? It just seems like when I saw the artwork, I was like, our management came to us and said, we got this company who wants to do a whole presentation, uh, how we're gonna roll out artwork and all this stuff. And I was like, whatever, this will be what I thought it was gonna suck. 
usually when they do artwork, I'll, I find different artists I like and I'll do paintings or they do whatever they, they do. And this artwork, they nailed it right on the head when I saw the picture and I was like, oh my God, this represents everything that I'm going through. Um, it's that malevolent force that's um, just the way the person's hung, it's just so fucking uncomfortable. And the, just the chaotic, you know, people with OCD, when you see those pictures of the cables, just all like that, it's very uneasy. You wanna like wrap them up and get them like neat, nice and neat. It's just chaos and darkness and all that balled in one and it just represented what was going on up here and around me spiritually. Um, I'm always, you know, skirted the line. I'm a, a, a perfect balance of light and dark. I don't ever judge. Um, I respect both sides. I call myself Switzerland. I'm completely neutral. Um, um, so just being in that whole world and, and dealing with it, that artwork and everything about it, the dark, and the light, everything's about balance, yin and yang, and it just seemed perfect. Yeah, of course, definitive classic Korn albums have paved the way of modern rock music and beyond that some of your albums have been critically acclaimed as standards and by your fans as well. To you, what is the ultimate Korn album that have perfectly captured the truest essence of the band so far as you had wished and dreamed in your soul, heart and mind? I mean, every, every album's a part. It's like a stamp in time. Um, this album really captured everything. Um, Untouchables captured everything. Path of Totality was very weird. It was just, it was such a giant leap creatively to do something like that. I think just all of them together as a whole are just different slots in time of us experimenting and and coming together and doing things differently. You know, I can't really. They're like babies to me. I can't be like, how do you pick your favorite kid? <laughs> I don't know. They're just all equally different. You've had an incredible career with a spectacular increasing success up until some point in the mid 2000 years where things began to me, things to be more complicated on the different levels. Uh -huh. As you were obviously associated with the new metal tag, uh -huh. at what point did you feel that once this very popular trend swept away by the medias and a part of its audience, mm -hmm. you'd leave the same disillusions of the glam metal era then icons? I, I never liked the, the, the being labeled something new metal, whatever that is. It doesn't, it's either you're good or not. <laughs> and, um, I guess we just made records people liked and it got us through that. I mean, we're, we're, you know, always hailed as the new metal godfathers and all that stuff. And I guess I'll look back years from now and I think that's pretty cool. But I mean, I just, I think we're just a heavy rock band and we definitely have our own thing going. And it just seems like at that point in time, once we became successful and all the bands that followed us tried to bite that sound or do that thing, that's new metal, not us. We just, we were paving the way doing our own thing. But you want to call us whatever you want, it's all up on you, I don't care, it's all good. It's not everybody's chance to live some kind of a second coming. Korn has raised again from some kind of troubled times and the band mm -hmm. is now at its best, at best again. How do you deal with that second part of your career and what have you learned from possible mistakes in the past? I mean, I just, you just, I know in this business there's peaks and valleys, ups and downs. And I'm just enjoying the upswing, man. <laughs> and I just only think we can go up from here and, and do our thing. I don't, you know, the older we get, the more it becomes more of a, of a uh, classic thing. We've been in a band 25 years, we're doing this, and it seems like bands that can get over that hump seem to, you know, the fans enjoy it and they stay there and you just, I'm gonna ride this wave as long as I can. A few years ago, uh, Head did write his memoirs to mm -hmm. let go all his issues, things, mm -hmm. things in his life. Is this something that you're thinking about? Oh, um, not at the time, not right now. I was working on it, but uh, when the time's right, I'll do it. So you get that in the back of your mind? Yeah, when the time's right, we'll, we'll see. It'll be interesting. In Paris, you've at low times, or was it a choice? I don't know. You played at the Bataclan at one yeah, point. Yeah. Before you played Bercy, which was the biggest yeah, arena yeah. Uh, in, in Paris back then. Yeah. Playing the Zenith is 
I guess, comfortable for you? Do you look forward to uh, playing in biggest venue in Paris? I mean, I play Bercy at Bataclan. Who, you know, it's all relative. Uh, whatever, whatever we can do, we'll be here to do. You know, I, I mean, I prefer Bercy. I love that that venue. It's huge. I like the big, big shows. There's just such energy in the room. But you know, Bataclan is the smaller thing. I mean, I played there even on my solo tour. So um, it's a, a beautiful room too. Um, just a question about one of your strange passion you were known for collecting serial killers items mm -hmm. that's a strange fascination that people can hardly understand given the very extreme personalities of those evil figures like Lemmy who was attracted to the Third Reich mm -hmm. stage, staging and imagery your obsession was totally misunderstood I guess do you regret having brought any kind of confusion around that no I just in the dark stuff man always been drawn towards dark things And uh, I don't regret anything I've ever collected or regret anything I've done. It's just that's what inspires me. Some people like to go to beautiful places and like beautiful things. I, I see beauty in darkness. So that's just my, that's my thing. It's just that because of the nature of the thing, it confuses people. It just it confuses people, people yeah. but I, I don't care. That's, I don't do things for other people. It's just stuff that inspires me and... I find beauty in, I don't find beauty in murder or nothing, just find beauty in dark things. And obviously from that, it's from my time working as a mortician and a true crime, of course I'd be interested in that. I'm not trying to glorify it or anything, it's just, I respect it and I'm interested in it. Um, regarding your, your, your past, you were a, a new wave fan back, totally, back yeah. in the days, in the, in the 80s, early mm -hmm. 90s, when you were... That was my teen teenager, yeah. It was your teenagers. Yeah. I think for all of us, the music that you, are, you were listening to when you were a teenager is the, is the truest kind of music that you're part yeah. of. Uh, what are the, the most uh, fascinating albums of your life? I don't know. I mean, Duran Duran's Rio was one of them. Um, Uh, Ministries Twitch, um, Christian Death, Theater of Pain. There's a lot of them. I went all over the place from industrial to goth to new wave. Um, I had, I loved ABC, remember that band ABC? Um, I loved all that, Thompson Twins, all those. It was that, the, the dawn of MTV and It was really exciting. I'd sit my ass in front of the TV all day and watch music videos. So that was my, uh, that was my teenage years. Uh, apart from your, uh, your interest in new uh, electronic music, mm -hmm. um, um, what are the new bands that you are, that you're discovering that you, are, you find very exciting? I haven't really, there's one, this band Skinned, just played that kit. I think they played Download. And, um, It's this girl and, and the guy, and they sing about serial killers. It's really dark, cool shit. I like them, but most, the majority of new music coming out, it just sounds all the same to me. Um, there's no originality. So I've been really listening to mu uh, music from the 20s, 30s, and 40s. I call it murder music. It's very dark, and um, I appreciate it because it was done the way it was recorded. There was no computers or anything. It's like you had to be a badass musician to do that stuff, so I really liked it. So those genres, 30s, 40s, and I've been listening to this, a lot of stuff from the 70s. You were part of a wave of music and culture, even if you don't like the term or the tag or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or anything about Whatever. it. Um, the, the trend comes and goes, as you said, and there, there have been many, many uh, success, successions of different uh, waves um, for the whole rock history. Mm -hmm. There's nothing coming along. Is it something that you've You're worried about that there is no new real scene, even if there are many, many little bands, but there's no, you know, big cultural movements uh, coming coming. I on. think, I don't know why it, it, it hasn't blown. I mean, in rock music, it's come pretty stagnant. The big cultural big thing was EDM music. That was the new thing that came around for the mainstream, the masses, all the DJs and all that. That's that was the new thing. And that's cool, but a lot, you know, for rock music and all that you know the whole models change there's no big labels pushing and having millions of dollars to do really cool shit i think i mean i got misquoted as saying that we were one of the last real rock bands what i meant by that was we were one of the last rock bands that we had 
a lot of money from a big label pushing us and, and allowing us to do huge things, you know, and and do really cool shit at the time. That they pushed money behind us and back us and got us on all these these tours and all this kind of stuff. So they don't do that anymore. And it's unfortunate. And that's why I think that it's kind of stagnant. Everyone's just playing it safe and there's nothing that's really come out that's different. I'm waiting. Hopefully they do figure it out. Is that yeah, the two of the famous magazine covers back in those days? Yeah. Um, Hard for Do you really. feel any kind of nostalgia about this era? Do you think back of these times when Follow the, Re the Leader and issues were hitting the world? Um, it was just, those were good times, man. This was when Follow the Leader started blowing up, and this is when uh, issues came out. I remember this thing. I was, we were, me and Monkey came over and we were so tired. And I'm, I had this idea, I'm like, let's get our shirts off and get in bed together. <laughs> We're just fucking around. And this shot has become so, I love this shot. We're in the bed smoking together. I think it's amazing. And that was just, that was like our coming of art. We're a heavy band, it's very serious, but that's us just making fun of ourselves. It's taking a shot at ourselves, I think it's amazing. And this was good times, man. I was fucked up out of my mind. Um, like I should be, I'm in my 20s. I call the 20s your terrible twos, but um, all over again. But, you know, after this record, I got sober after Follow the Leader. And this record, Issues, was the first record I was sober. So, good times. And in, in terms of success, stories, everything, do you feel nostalgic about that? Or do you only concentrate about the present and obviously the future? I mean, I like to be nostalgic and look back and appreciate those times, but I'm always right, like, what are we doing next? I don't want to live there. I like being now. I try to keep myself in the now at all times. Um, those were good times, young and dumb, and uh, great, great times, but um, I'm a lot happier. With age comes a lot of wisdom and, and things get a little bit easier, you figure it out, you know what I mean? Are you most proud of that longevity, more than 25 years of career, or, yeah. or of all the high peaks of this career? I love just the longevity. I've got, it's been an amazing ride and I don't want it to stop. Um, like I said, I'm middle-aged and I'm still going and I think it's amazing. It's, a, it's, it's definitely a gift. It is said that after years together, many famous bands do not hang together anymore and communi communicate with each other through managers and lawyers. Uh, we know that Crohn's members are very, very tight yeah. family, very tight unit. How would you define that relationship after all those years and chaos and everything? I just think we're just one of those bands that have been lucky that we still get along, love each other and, and just figure that we've had our ups and downs, but with any family you get you fight you know it's just how being family is but you forgive and you forget and you just move on so it's just we're lucky that we have that kind of relationship i love each one of those guys i do anything for them they're my brothers and that's something really special about this band